generous with all these wonderful data that she's collected and allowing us to pursue things that, we, that inspired us. Um, so when I came to her lab, I'll tell you in a second about these longitudinal, long-term studies that she's collected. My first entry into the lab was digging through her basement, uh, through her basement and, and closets. And I found a box of videotapes of parent-child interaction, and I decided that's what I wanted to look at. Um, so she was very generous. And so, so with, with these tapes, what happened, I, I started coding them, looking for responsiveness, maternal responsiveness, which really wasn't so much talked about in the lab before I came. I think it sounded a little bit European to them, um, because a lot of what they talked about when they talked about parent-child interaction, they talked about structure. Parents should be more structured. That was sort of the idea. Um, so in the end, when I ended up with the finding, which I'll talk about, that responsiveness actually predicted in her long-term data how children developed over time, there was a second finding in my data. It was a null result finding, which is I had also coded parents of kids with autism and coded parents of children with other developmental delays and typical developing babies, and I didn't find any group references. And I sort of thought, well, like most researchers, I think, sort of, well, we have null results. There's no group differences. Let's forget about it. But Marion was very, felt very strongly and sort of said, well, this is a very important finding. What you found is that parents of kids with autism are as responsive as parents of other children. And that's an important finding, even though it's not, you know, it doesn't sort of meet the standards of hypothesis testing the way we usually do. So, so that was sort of part of what, what made her so wonderful. I mean, I, I don't have to mention how, how important her work was. When I first came to her lab, we, one of my first sort of tasks was to take videotapes of toddlers who had a baby, an older sibling who had autism. And I didn't quite understand at the time, why do I videotape children who all seem to be developing fine? Why is that so important? Well, what I didn't understand at the time that she was pioneering this whole research world of baby SIP studies that during the last decade have really been one of the most productive areas of, of research, at least in this kind of field of early diagnosis and intervention. I think that was true for a lot of the things that she did. Um, she introduced the thinking about joint attention and social interaction to the field. Um, that now everybody talks about, but back in the days when she talked about it, nobody did. She was one of the first pe per people to actually know that you follow people. I mean, if you want to understand autism, you have to follow them over time, not just for a year or two, but follow them into adolescence, into adulthood, see how they, they develop and how they change. Um, and during her last decades in her career, she spent a lot of time sort of understanding similar to, to what, what is done here at Weill Cornell, trying to understand, or understanding the need that basic biologists and, and clinical people need to find a way to talk to each other. So what she had built at UCLA during the last two decades is really an infrastructure to do that kind of work, where she brought together people, people studying the brain and people studying genes. And she brought in a lot of new people to the field that way and form, formed this wonderful interdisciplinary center. So, so I think for, for me personally, um, I'm just very honored to have been her student. And, and I think for all of us, we, we owe so much to her. Um, and it, anyway. Um, so so uh, I'm... I'm presenting, this is a slide, one of the first slides that I created in her lab. It's, it's a slide from her study. It's a, I hope you can make sense of it. It's essentially a slide of 47 children who came to her lab starting when they're about three, four, or five years of age. And then she followed them into adulthood. Um, and she, you can see from the slide, some of the lines ended 15 years, some ended 25. So there was a lot of variability in the sample. But what it gives you an idea of is how the language of these children evolved over time. So you can see some of the lines stay rather flat. So that those are children who didn't really develop expressive language so much. And some of the lines go up. So those are the children who, who acquired significant amounts of language. And, and what you'll see in a lot of pictures that have been done sim in similar ways since look quite similar. There's, there's sort of a good chunk of children who don't make much progress in terms of language skills, and there's a group that does. And a lot of the early work that Marion had done was trying to understand why that is, specifically for language, but then also more generally. Um, and there are really sort of two 
connected findings that sort of stand out. Um, if I, just as an example, if I say the word Tür, which is a German word, which most of you probably don't understand, you don't know what I'm talking about. If I do the same thing and say Tür and point to the door, you guys understand what I'm talking about. So, so what this sort of means is that for language acquisition, and that's true for second language acquisition, but also for first word language acquisition, what the child needs to do, it needs to interpret another person's communicative signals, like gestures or context or something like that, um, to understand what the language that the child hears actually is about. So a lot of early language acquisition has to do about figuring out how to coordinate your attention with another person. And I brought a little video clip. This is not a parent. This is just myself playing with a child. Um, but just to sort of give you an idea of just focus on how this coordination of attention works during a, a typical play interaction, really. I hope I can get it to play. This is a demonstration oh. This, this was not a commercial for flip from that. <laughs> um, so so you, you'll see in a typical interaction, there's a lot of shifting attention around, uh, back and forth between topics, one topic to another, and the two interactive partners sort of shift together, and one person moves, and the other follows, and so forth. And what Marion and, and in our work we have found is that there's two early characteristics that predict language growth. One is children's joint attention skills. So this is the ability, it's a very simple test, really the ability to follow when someone points to an object, which typical developing children learn very early on. Um, most, most children with autism have a really hard time or delay in. But the, and the other piece of it is apparent behavior. It's the parent the extent to which the parent just talks about the things that the child is already looking at, talks about the things that the child is already doing. So it's a measure of parental responsiveness. And both of these metrics, um, of these measures, predict to children's language growth independently of each other. Um, so it's the child's responsiveness to the parent, but also the parent's responsiveness to the child that contribute to children's language growth. And I put the correlations down here. They're, they're strikingly strong. So these are correlations between responsiveness at age four and, and child language 16 years later. So these are long-term predictions. These are predictions that are visible during adolescence and adulthood. Um, oh. so, um, so what do we know about helping parents being more responsive? Um, and I, I just sort of, on the backdrop, I want to re reiterate the finding from earlier. There's no reason to believe that parents of children with autism are any less responsive than parents of other children. Um, but the, the idea is that children with autism, because they have difficulty coordinating their attention with other people, they really need sort of an additional level of responsiveness. So, so that, that was the idea. And we know that this kind of responsiveness predicts language growth in typical developing children. We actually know the same fi similar findings from children who are born prematurely, children with other developmental delay, children with Down syndrome, children with fragile legs. So this is sort of a, a, a consistent finding that maternal responsiveness during early stages of language development predicts language growth. Interestingly, we know very little about how to help parents be more responsive. Um, we haven't really paid much attention to this. Um, if we think about sort of adult education in general, I'm a college teacher in part. So the question is, how do you actually convey information, usable information to students? And, and generally, the field has sort of shifted away from a focus on just skill attainment, but trying to really give parents or families the capacity to meet the needs of the children. So the, the, the goal of, of intervention programs has been not to just Tell, give parents only very specific skills, do this, do this, do this, but to really see, engage the parents in a process that really empowers them to meet the needs of their children. 
So, so what does that mean? So this family capacity building approach means 